Well, good evening and welcome everyone to night eight, the final night of Plenary Tracker, bringing you news and insights from the Plenary Council from the Australasian Catholic Coalition for Church Reform and Concerned Catholics, Canberra Goulburn. My name is Genevieve Jacobs with you tonight from the lands of the Wiradjuri people whose elders and traditional ownership I acknowledge and the elders of the places from whence you join us. We've had a, a wonderful run of plenary trackers, lots of conversation about major church issues that are and aren't part of the council proceedings. Once again, please post your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen through our moderator, who is Tracy McEwen tonight. Let's continue to have that respectful engagement to ask questions that take us somewhere meaningful will be robust, be critical, carry to. James is our technical administrator and you can message him through the Q&A screen if you're experiencing any difficulties. Tonight, we'll wrap up the council's proceedings and try to make some sense of this vast gathering with three distinguished guests, all of whom have been longtime advocates and commentators on the Australian Catholic Church. But first, and for the last time, here is the news. The first assembly of the Plenary Council formally ended today with the President of the Australian Bishops' Conference, Archbishop Mark Coleridge, celebrating the closing mass. The Archbishop was, despite some heavyweight opposition from his fellow bishops, a major instigator of the plenary, which some liken to the church performing open heart surgery on itself. Mark Coleridge finished his sermon with perhaps a touch of pessimism, but looking for a miracle to save the day when the plenary assembles again, and that happens in July in Sydney next year. He likened the process to the, the pain and the mess of childbirth, which nonetheless ends in the joy of a newborn baby. He hopes this is a metaphor of the outcome from all the plenary's agonizing because as he said, nothing is impossible to God. Plenary President Archbishop Tim Costello was last night similarly wary about the next nine months of work to come up with concrete reform proposals. He spoke of walking together, holding in creative tension, many different and contrasting voices. Francis Sullivan in his blog is optimistic that change is coming, but he's urging the bishops and members to study and to absorb a so far almost ignored roadmap, the light from the Southern Cross before they meet again. While John Warhurst in his blog tempers his optimism with a warning to the Bishop's appointed steering committee, he says assembly members will not tolerate another closed and unaccountable process which led to the flawed agenda questions of the first assembly. Let's go to our first guest this evening. John Warhurst joins us again. He's Chair of Concerned Catholics Canberra Goulburn, a Plenary Council member and Emeritus Professor of Political Science at the Australian National University. John, great to talk to you again. On the first night, we spoke about high expectations, about everything being on the table as council delegates, informed by many thousands of submissions, attempted to discern the future for the Australian church. Have the hopes been fulfilled? Thanks, Genevieve. Uh, certainly a lot's happened since we spoke last Sunday. Um, I think people probably had varied hopes. Um, I think a lot's been achieved. And uh, like Francis Sullivan, I'm hopeful. Uh, it's a small step, as concerned Catholics have said in, their, in our media release, uh, but I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, I would like to give a shout out to those who organised the Plenary Council. It was a massive enterprise conducted in difficult circumstances, and Lana Turvey Collins and Mark Coleridge, Tim Costello, others who played a leading role, deserve, deserve credit for their achievements. And I think for most of the, uh, most of the members, it was certainly like not like anything they'd ever done before and uh and a memorable occasion i think um there's so much to weigh up i mean i i'd be very happy to talk about the principles underlying the whole exercise the process of which i was i have been very critical leading up to the uh, assembly um and the actual uh week's work uh itself um i think the first thing that should be said is that um there was a ferment of ideas, uh, not just inside the assembly, but around the assembly, much of which, or some of which we've created ourselves. And I think that's a very important step forward for the church in Australia, because many of the things that we want to do as reformers have got a good airing in the last uh, seven, or eight, seven or eight days. Um, so I think that's a very important step. And I think there has been a momentum uh, towards let's call it a new beginning, uh, however you want to call it, the new baby uh, that's emerged. Uh, and I think that's a positive step too. Um, the record as far as 
each of those agenda items I think is I think is mixed. I think on some agenda items, um, uh, and I would uh, I would single out um, the inclusion of Aboriginal culture and spirituality uh, in the church, uh, the moment, momentum for ecological conversion. They would certainly be two uh, that I think came out of the week uh, very well. Um, I think although the work of the church has been underway for a long time as far as responding to the Royal Commission is concerned, at the very least, I think the members um, made it quite clear that they would accept nothing less than a most wholehearted and generous and continuing lifelong response uh, on child sexual abuse. And on some other issues that I've been particularly concerned about, such as governance, I think a good first step was, was taken. There are a couple of small groups who were involved in uh, talking through issues of governance. And I think uh, those of us involved in that area uh, think that um, a good first step has been taken. So, John, real progress in some areas, that determination you've just spoken of around child sexual abuse and safeguarding for better leadership around Indigenous issues and ecological conversion. We've touched very frequently during these conversations on the tracker each night on the role of women. Are there clearer ways forward? I think the big absence in terms of the organisation of the Plenary Council was a single group or a major session about what I think is the, the biggest issue of all for the church, and that is the role of women in decision-making and, and ministry. I think I'd want to, um, and I don't think the outcomes were as strong as they should have been, but I would say that in terms of the first half of that uh, aspect, that is women in decision-making, there was certainly a, an emphasis from at least a good majority of the members that the days of inequality for women and for lay people in, uh, in decision-making have have passed. They can't be allowed to uh, to continue anymore. I think the whole question of uh, women in ministry and the ordination of women deacons uh, and and priests is a long, much longer battle. I don't think that was uh, handled uh, well during the, during the week. Uh, I'm not sure what more can be done over the next uh, nine months. But yes, I think. Um, uh, I, of course, when you think of women and man 20 years ago, and most of those issues haven't been raised 20 years ago, the church is certainly on notice that you, you just can't, you, the church has an appalling record. Um, it knows what to do and it just has to get on with it. Mm, and, and certainly my sense from our conversations has been that there's quite a lot of productive things that could be done right now, a diocesan pastoral councils and the like, a commitment towards women's equal representation in the leadership of the laity ordination a much bigger step but John you've said the elephant in the room is sexuality and in particular justice for, for LGBTQIA plus Catholics and the deep divides between traditional church hard lines and, and what many younger Catholics honestly see as rank hypocrisy. Yes absolutely I mean I would uh, I'm not a younger Catholic but I would uh, agree absolutely rank hypocrisy and uh, justice for for LGBTQIA uh, Catholics is uh, was far removed from the from the plenary council. There were several very powerful uh, interventions. I won't say who they were by because it's up to them to uh, to say that. I think, but uh, there were some. The, the issue wasn't lost, uh, but either in the small groups or in the um, um, in the interventions, and the in, the issue wasn't lost also uh, during. Uh, Thursday's special session about reaching out to the vulnerable and, and others on the peripheries of the of the church, but it wasn't headlined in the way it should have been, and it remains, I think, um, a cultural and and mm -hmm. theological divide uh, among Catholics, which must be addressed. As you said, um, for younger Catholics, it's a no-brainer, and if the church and the bishops, the authorities, are concerned about why young Catholics are not in the pews, then that's clearly one issue which stands out. Um, hypocrisy is worse than just about any other sin or, or crime. Uh, and uh, young people can sniff that out a mile away uh, and they won't, won't tolerate it. And when that issue was discussed in the groups that I was involved in, um, there was support from across what you might call the cultural and theological divide because justice for LGBTIQA uh, Catholics um, through family connections, through the personal um, contact with, which most Catholics have with um, the issue, 
um, crosses many divides. And I was often quite surprised by those uh, women and men who spoke openly in uh, small groups uh, and generally for such justice. And I think there's a call to the church authorities that you can't uh, ignore the issue anymore. Well, indeed, and, and certainly there were some very powerful moments in our conversations each night. Um, last night's conversation particularly sticks in my mind because the reality of social change is that Catholics everywhere are connected to have people whom they love and, and for whom they have great respect who are part of the LGBTQIA plus community. So unavoidable. And absolutely, some... absolutely. And I think if I may say so, Genevieve, um, it stands out as just one example of the general uh, theme which I would uh, advocate, and that is the church must go to the world, and the church must view what is positive about mainstream Australian society. It must not expect mainstream society to come to the church, and it must not be negative or fearful of mainstream society. And uh, there's a number of issues clearly which are in that bag of issues, none more important th than the one we're speaking about. So, John, now it's onwards to the Second Assembly. Do you have faith that the, the weight and the meaning of all these deliberations and before that of all the thousands of submissions will be carried forward with real respect to that Second Assembly next year? Faith might be too strong a word, but I, I certainly have hope. Um, and uh, my message has always been that this is only the start of a long process. And that anyone who's concerned about reform in the church has to knuckle down, not just to this assembly, uh, but to the nine months uh, which lead on to the second assembly next, next July. And I, I think we can argue about advocacy and issues. And uh, I think we know where we stand on most of those issues. But I think we have to argue about process. And my advice, uh, my suggestions would be that this is a terribly important time between now and next July, and that we must make sure that those on the steering committee, those on the drafting committee, those who, are, who now hold those, this valuable cargo, if you like, this valuable gift from the Australian Catholic community, um, are kept up to the mark. Uh, we can't be inside the room necessarily, although I would argue that it must be as transparent as possible and much more transparent than it was leading up to this past week but we have to keep people up to the mark. And there are many people within the process who have a very good heart towards doing that, but I think they also need advice on how to do it. And I'm struck over the last week by how broad the agenda was. Look, I've had people come back to me already saying, how can you possibly in one week or even in nine months deal with such a broad agenda? And I think the shaping of the agenda and the shaping of the proposals will be absolutely crucial and it can't be allowed to be done behind closed doors. That's where my hope comes from because I feel members, many members uh, have been empowered by the process. They've seen a week of, of dialogue on pretty equal terms with all the other, with the authorities and with all the other participants. They've, they've built networks around the country which didn't exist before and that, of course, applies also to people who might be opposed to change. Let's be realistic. But those networks and that momentum and that empowerment, I think, will... Um, it's hard to me, for me to say being caught up inside, and it may be these things are better said by observers, but for someone inside, I, I do think there is hope. And, and I do think uh, many of us will be working very hard over the next nine months to bring those hopes to fruition, Gerald, Genevieve. John, terrific. We will come back to you for questions. Time now to go to this evening's panellists. Paul Collins is with us, church historian, writer and broadcaster. He's been involved in church renewal for 45 years. And journalist and author Geraldine Du, who's presenter of the ABC's Saturday Extra and was awarded an AO for services on issues involving ethics, values, religion and social change. Wonderful to have you both here for this evening's supercharged panel. Um, Paul Collins, I I'm going to start with you. Did the Plenary Council tackle the fundamentals front on? And is it your sense there's room for real change? I know governance, for example, was one of your great concerns. What's your take on this? Well, I think what's been lacking all along is perspective. Um, 
John actually was right. He said that, in a way, this is an incident. This is what it is part of the renewal of the church. That renewal began in 1965. Um, and it's been ongoing and it's been, uh, it's been both strong and weak in all of those years since the end of the Second Vatican Council. What I see the Plenary Council as a kind of um, just an incident uh, in that much bigger process. My whole problem with the Council, and, and, I, and I speak here as an outsider, again, John made an interesting distinction, um, he speaks as an insider. He understands the dynamics that are going on there, the enthusiasm, the goodness, the generosity that you find in people. I, like the vast majority of people watching uh, this uh, Zoom session, uh, speak as an outsider. Uh, I just uh, look at it, uh, I'm, a, I'm afraid, as both a historian and a person in media with a jaundiced eye, and uh, what I see is, uh, as I said, an incident in a long ongoing process um, and an incident that unfortunately, in my view, is not tackling the basic issue. The basic issue is the nature of the church. Now, the bishops, uh, the hierarchy, the conservatives, they don't want to have a bar of that. They want that kept off the agenda. What uh, we really have to tackle is the hierarchical church, the monarchical church, the very thing that Archbishop Coleridge said that we can't go on with business as usual in the, uh, the bishops as monarchs in their own feudal kingdoms. That's the question that's got to be tackled. And what all the stuff about governance is meaningless because what you are doing is tacking onto a monarchical church. Um, a, a model that is past its use by date by far. You're tacking on to that um, accountability, transparency, all of those uh, things that are, are values for us. So um, I'm disappointed with the, uh, with, the, with the plenary. I'm disappointed because I don't think it tackled, uh, and in fact, all the lead up to it didn't tackle that basic issue, the nature of the church, and the fact that we are in a long, ongoing historical process of implementing Vatican II, uh, Vatican II, and we're still a long way from achieving that. Mm -hmm. Geraldine, let, let me come to you. Um, despite the fact that cynicism is perhaps the cancer of we old lags in the media, you found the aspirations for the Plenary Council pretty impressive. What's your sense of how likely they are to come to fruition? Oh, look, I, I'm not sure is the answer. I mean, I'm listening to, to John and Paul's deep wariness. Uh, look, I had very, I, I have uh, very uh, distinct aspirations myself. I wanted mm -hmm. this to be a temperamental shift. I wanted at the end of it to feel that the laity had stepped up to its own self-respect, to its own sense that it might be asked more of itself and therefore suggest more. And I wanted the ordained uh, uh, group to not so much step down or back, but to step to a new zone, which was much more alongside this embod emboldened laity. So I was looking for both groups to shift in, in temperamental style and in self-identity. And I certainly saw the beginnings of that. So I, I really felt that the, I thought, look, that first couple of days, I personally felt you could see the bishops think, oh my God, what, what have we done? <laughs> what have we actually loosened here? You could see it, you could see it. Um, and I was looking on from outside. And, but the lady, look, see what I got from it was a tremendous discussion about life in the parishes and in our structures, life, the need for more life. And that's now how we do that. That's what I'm preoccupied now. What, sort, what will we need to show that that can be um, distilled? What about the money involved in it? I had a very interesting interview with um, Archbishop Mark today at the end of the, of the mass, which has just gone on my plenary matters tonight, just been posted 
where he said, look, we're in trouble. We all know we're in trouble. Yeah. And we, yeah. yes, the money isn't there for easy application for all of this, but the curiosity again and again and again, uh, the curiosity about how we bring more life into our existing structures, I found that very uh, inviting. But Paul Collins, I mean, back to you on that, that notion that, that we've got to find a really meaningful, purposeful way to go on. Nobody's in doubt that there needs to be change, but we can't stop ministry and mission while we're wrangling over our internal problem. Mm. The problems won't go away by being ignored. We've got this sort of irreconcilable dilemma. And then, you know, the cynic again would say, well, Rome and the bishops still control the whole process. I mean, where do you see the grounds for productivity and hope out of this? Well, look, I think that's a key question, Genevieve. Um, <laughs> it's all very well for, for me as a historian to pontificate about models of church. Um, and, and, I, and I do understand that you, you know, anyone might well be cynical about that. But I think the way in which change occurs within the Catholic Church um, is often not through church, through hierarchical church structures. The way the change occurs in the Catholic Church is through people ministering. I, I think what, look, when I, when I think of what the church could be, I think of a number of small communities in Australia who are committed Catholic communities who are centred around the Eucharist, and I, I can name a couple of them in Western Australia, uh, in Melbourne, and in other places in Australia. They are centred around the Eucharist, but it is not a Eucharist that's just one of these inward-looking Eucharists that we all feel happy and, and clappy and comfortable in. It's a Eucharist that's geared to going out to serve the community. Um, the one in Western Australia that I'm thinking of, uh, it, they, they serve in the prison ministry. Uh, they are actually working in prisons uh, and, and developing programs whereby prisoners are given some rehabilitation. So I think that's what the church needs to be doing. It needs to be actually beginning with ground level communities. I mean, that was the great thing about liberation theology. It took on that cardine, um, um, that cardine model of see, judge, act. It, it, and to me, uh, you know, one of the tragedies in some ways is that we have lost that. In some ways, <clears throat> that was suppressed um, during probably the most disastrous papacy since the Reformation. Um, I won't mention which pope, but he was of Polish extraction. <laughs> um, the, so, so to me, the, 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 we've got to begin to minister. We've got to begin to form communities, independent of bishops and priests, that go out into the community to serve. Now, I know that's idealistic, but that's how religious orders began. That, that's, I mean, people have been doing this in church history for all of church history. And I'm confident and I have hope that that will come. I think we do have an opportunity with Pope Francis because what Pope Francis has done, I think the key thing that he's done besides his environmental emphasis is he has shifted the, the focus of the church from ideology to pastoral care and ministry. If you were talking to John Paul II or Benedict XVI, the key issue was maintaining the moral code where, you know, you're maintaining the ideal. There'll be no compromise on that. What Pope Francis has said is that it is pastoral ministry that is absolutely central. And then when asked about rainbow people, he says, who am I to judge? So I do have confidence that the spirit will work. Um, it's just that, uh, um, and I'm sure there will be have been some people at the, the plenary council who will be doing the very things that I'm talking about. Uh, and they will be, I think, more important than all of the governance stuff, uh, than all of whatever bishops do. Paul, you've just reminded me, I haven't really thought about liberation theology for years. I've got a, an extraordinary <laughs> recollection of being in year 11 and being given a book about liberation theology by one of the nuns. And I'm sitting here thinking, I wonder how many younger Catholics even know about the enormous power of that movement and that idea yes. of, of, of embracing everyday life and change. 
Geraldine, we heard a great deal about synodality throughout the mm, Council. Mm, mm. What does that mean for the Australian church? What does it mean going forward from this week's momentous events? We really don't know, and that is part of the issue, that I think we now have to try to really define what that means. Um, and I, the, the, the more we got into it, the more I realised I had a very diffuse, somewhat woolly understanding of what synodality meant. And there's a very good piece by uh, Massimo Fagioli and the latest Lacroix about, um, you know, who will be there? What does it really mean? It's not monarchical. It's, it's not collegiate. What is it? Exactly what is it? Who will participate? How will it occur? So, look, I, I think it sounds wonderful you know what I mean <laughs> but the reality of trying because I'm so in favor of the idea of the broadest range of talents uh, being viv revivified by the, the the church's tradition and serving it that's what I dream of but quite how you make all this work um, I, I, that's what I think needs a great deal of respectful engagement and I suppose for me um, you know, it's funny, really, I just, I was so enlivened by the clear emotion being shown um, by people knowing that their parishes could be, as they called it, local hubs for so much. Yeah. And, um, you know, Francine Parola was one of my early interviews, and she said something so sort of basic that, and, and it was repeated by others, you know, we assume the, the church, the schools do it all, and then, you know, oh, you may have a course or two. Uh, and if you're a teacher, you might have a course every year. But what else? Seriously, what else routinely in, in a, you know, a gutsy way really helps people sitting in those pews, trying their best, possibly receiving a very average homily to actually grow? And what was to be honest, it's one of the biggest things I took out. I sort of went back over my copious notes and thought, you know, for tonight, what, the, what did I really get? I got this exceptional sense that people knew their parishes were falling short and they didn't want them to. Now, that wasn't bad, you know. That really wasn't a bad thing to hear. And it, when they did their summaries, their Friday summaries, oh, well, it's just, you know, absolutely routinely with some quite game and and frankly you know noble language so look um and you know the need to serve australian family life in the 21st century with all its stresses one of them said well <laughs> having just been you know you go to birthday parties for for your own grandchildren <laughs> you just watch the families at work or you know struggling and you think yep yeah, that's mm. where i want it to be Yes. Can I can I come come in there, yeah. Genevieve? Um, I, I mean, I think Geraldine's put her finger on something here, and that is that in Australia there are, there were and still are a number of successful parishes. That is, parishes in which. Uh, priests who have enough emotional intelligence and leadership skills to be able to retreat and or their whole job is to nurture the gifts of the community and to bring the community on to begin to run the whole thing. Now, I, I've seen that time after time because um, especially pre and, I, and I, I have to say this, you know, priests of my generation, many of them have men, have men who have worked like slaves all their lives, who have been utterly committed to the church and who have done tremendous pastoral work. But, but the tragedy is, and I've seen this time after time after time, and in fact experienced it in, have experienced it in parishes myself, where a good priest is replaced uh, by uh, the Uber Hauptsturmführer, and who has to uh, control everything, who had, does not lack totally the emotional intelligence to be able to allow other people liberty. Now, I, I mean, what we've got to do is, is there, there'll be parishes that we can develop as these local communities. But above all, I think what we've got to add to them and emphasise is that it is not just to nurture the faithful, 
uh, not just our nurturance. It, it, we are nurtured by going out to serve. The St. Vincent de Paul Society, I think, illustrates that perfectly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, ministry, the word for ministry in, in Greek is related to the word for liturgy in Greek. Yeah. Uh, the, the two words are very closely related to each other uh, because ministry is, if you like, the living out of liturgy. And look, look, the phrase that has resonated for me throughout this week of discussions has been that the church is for all the baptised, yeah. the leadership, the responsibility, everything that encompasses being church in Australia is for all the baptised, not for small select groups, not for those who are parked to one side. Let's move on now to your questions for our moderator, Tracy McEwen. Tracy's been a terrific asset behind the scenes in all the organisation of the Plenary Tracker, and she's the Vice President of Women in the Australian Church. Take it away, Tracy. Hi, thanks so much, Genevieve. It's been great to be here this week. So, just listening to you all speaking then, Geraldine, you mentioned the laity stepping up and Genevieve mentioned people pushing on. And Paul, you said it's about people ministering. John, you mentioned knuckling down to reform between now and next July. The Australian Women Preach podcast, which we at WATAC have developed in conjunction with the women from the Grail, was a direct result of the Plenary Council discernment process. Its purpose is to embody the richness that lay men and women preaching would give to the church. Are there other initiatives that you might know of or that we might conceive in the next um, in the time between the next session, where the fruit of discernment might uh, and renewing the church might step outside those traditional ch structures. Well, oh, I don't know whether I'm actually the right person to ask that that question. I, <laughs> I thought you were heading towards saying, you know, what can we do over the next nine months? And I was going to say, I said knuckling down uh, to uh, leading to the second assembly but I didn't want to take emphasis away from the things that Geraldine and Paul have been speaking about and the many reforms, including liturgical in new directions, uh, new directions in parish life, um, governance reform in, in parishes and, uh, and dioceses, new formation um, for lay leadership and, and, and others. And there's a lot of, uh, formation being going going on um, around the country, which in some ways is a development of the last uh, five or 10 years. So um, not quite answering your question, but I would say that, that I've never said, in fact, that everything should be in the plenary council basket, but I do see the plenary council empowering the individuals involved in the, in the assembly uh, and also um, see so many opportunities um, everywhere in the church, not just in parishes and dioceses, but, but in lay communities and religious institutes and PJPs and uh, the whole diversity of the, of the church, um, which should be going on without waiting for what happens in next July or anything else, um, not even being part of the long story since 1965. I mean, the, the things to be done are already there um, and um, they can be taken up by by anyone really, lay, clergy, religious women and men, um, or, or even other, other leaders. And that's what I'd be urging people to do over the next nine months. Great, thanks, John. Yeah, I think there's a sense that, you know, real Catholics are in parishes and attend mass. And I think that with less than 10% of Catholics currently attending mass in, in our parishes, we do need to kind of look outside those structures, as you said, to our PJPs, to St. Vincent de Paul, as I think, um, um, was was mentioned to see, you know, what we, what they're doing that can be brought to those traditional structures. I mean, Claire, um, Victory, Claire Victory, who was on the, the tracker, is the national president of the of the St Vincent de Paul and a really important figure inside the the plenary council. And I do want to put that on the uh, put that on the record. And um, and many others within the plenary council will be going back to their own communities. Uh, yeah, and uh, one final thing, if I may say so. And that's to give a shout out to Geraldine um, and to Francis Sullivan and others, who I think through their involvement in, 
in reaching the 90% rather than just speaking to the 10%. Yeah, because yep. the church media can only at best speak to a, a fraction of the 10%. Whereas those who have the voice to reach out to mainstream Australia, where the 90% of Catholics are located, uh, they, the, they perform an incredibly valuable um, um, role in uh, the Catholic community. Um, Paul, you, you mentioned a monarchical church and like a model that's passed its use by date. Um, there was early, mentioned earlier this week about the use of titles and honorifics um, and the trappings of, um, of, of, of office, you know, the dress and trappings of office. Um, and, you know, this was the case, we, we saw a lot of this that was reported back in the, in the public sessions this week. Um, what, what do you think can be done to like tackle this clericalism and this clerical power head on? Um, and how do we, this is, a, so there's kind of two questions merged into this. How do we push for change in the seminaries um, and the formation of um, young men who are heading into the priesthood um, to influence the next generation? Um. Well, look, um, the model comes from the 16th, the model we're operating out of largely today comes from the 16th century. Forget Constantine, um, we can forget the Middle Ages as well. They gave us canon law, which is a noose around our neck, but the model comes from St. Robert Bellarmine in the 16th century. He's the bloke who put it into, uh, into form, if you like, in his book, uh, his controversies against the Protestants. Remember that it's the 16th century. They love costume in the 16th century. They love style and class. Cardinals are dressed in Renaissance dress. That's how, you know, nobility in the Renaissance dressed. Berettas are originally, just like Satans, are originally um, sign, uh, signs of academic achievement. It's just like our university gowns. Um, and in fact, in some European universities, they wear ha hats that are a little bit like a Beretta. Um, so what we've got to do is that from, we. I don't want to turn mass into, um, with due respect to all my Baptist friends, into a Baptist Eucharist. That is that the minister stands there in a suit and tie. I don't want to do that. I do believe that there we do should have some form of vestment uh, given to the people leading the, uh, the worship. So, I mean, I just think we've got to jettison a lot of, I mean, for God's sake, why do we wear bishops wear those stupid skull caps? Um, why? I mean, I looked at Mark Coleridge preaching this morning and he had on that absurd mitre. We <laughs> don't even know the origin of the mitre. It comes from the 10th century. We, we think we know where it comes from. It's all in my book on Europe in the 10th century, but we don't even know the origin of it or what its purpose is. More importantly than that, I think, is the question on seminaries. Um, I, and, and, and here I think a little bit of radical surgery is required. And I noticed that a number of people at the PC mentioned this. The seminaries are an invention of 17th century France. Uh, they, were, they were set up uh, to make sure that the clergy got some uh, intellectual training. And the clergy became the first of the professions. Well, the law followed them and medicine followed the law and the clergy. Now, what it, 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 it is a profession in the sense that they do really need some formation, but they need to do that formation in the very community that they work in, and they need to come from that community in the first place so that we don't take 23 or 24-year-old males who like to dress up in cassocks and variegated other uh, paraphernalia, a bit like the Pharisees with their wider phylacteries and longer tassels, um, they've got to be working in the community, with the community, understanding the questions and the, the, the things that are important to the community. So seminaries have outlived. They're another 16th century invention. It's time to get beyond the 16th century. That's my message tonight in a way. Thanks, Paul. Um, Geraldine, you've We've just been talking about how you've been the interface between the 90% um, and the inner workings of the Plenary Council in, in some respects, you know, with, with your podcast and speaking to key people. Um, 
the, um, one of the questions here that we've got was that at, at Vatican II, you know, the highest um, modern teaching of the church um, episode of the church um, stated the church is the people of God. Um, you know, are you hearing that there's any kind of guarantee that's being put in place that the, the wisdom of the people of God, as evidenced in the discussion so far, will actually be listened to and endorsed? And are we hearing or, you know, why is there a reluctance to address the serious stuff that affects all of us, the people of God? I guess well, for 90%. <laughs> yeah, well, you see, I think dysfunctional parishes affect the bulk of us, you know. I happen, I happen to actually believe that I'm a systems person. I believe in systems working well, which then enable you to have your really alive, you know, your people who go out into the community, so, who prompt very creative actions, such as Paul is talking about, and prompt people who are sort of more politically minded, such as John is talking about. I believe the, the hub, the hub and spoke model comes from that parish. Now, I know there was quite a debate a few years back. I didn't hear any of it at the, and I don't know whether John, who was sitting inside, did, that actually parishes were an outdated concept too for the modern world with um, uh, communications technology and with um, the divisions within modern cities. So, but I didn't hear any um, alternative seriously put. I heard that sort of emphasis on face-to-face -face ability to contact and that sense that you had a, you, there was a, a, something tangible you could relate to. I happen, I happen to be frankly quite obsessed with that. Um, so I, I certainly, in terms of answering the questioner, no, we didn't hear an absolute commitment about uh, listening to all the things that were said, but my goodness, the sheer bulk nature of creative endeavor and um, clever language and such obvious enthusiasm and ex dare I say exuberance, I'm not saying that necessarily is followed through, but there was a real sense that you couldn't miss of consciously trying. I, I cannot believe it'll be completely sidelined. Now, when it gets down to the business of, you know, absolute Episcopal authority versus um, collegiality, look, there's a long way to go. There's a long way to go. But that's why I put my emphasis on the laity believing they had a right to be there. See, I don't think we have. For all the wondrous talk that your marvellous group has done, I think the bulk of the Australian Catholics sort of thought, oh, you know, I don't have time, I'm not trained, I'm not formed, um, I'll leave it to them, it's not working. So we've got to change a whole set of attitudes among them, the ordained, and us, in my opinion. Oh, it's, it's interesting that you say that, Geraldine, because, you know, I, um, I guess I'm coming from a group of younger Catholics, and I see a group of young women who are, and, and men who are extremely formed, who, who are more than ready and adequate um, and kind of pushing to take part in their church. I mentioned the statistic the other, a couple of nights ago, that we've got um, a quarter of young women who are in parishes, not outside parishes, in parishes, a quarter of young women under 36 who are saying, I have leadership and ministry skills. Only 1% of those are on a parish council. Why is that? But one last question. Sorry, I just had to push that in. <laughs> one last question for John. And, and this is kind of to wrap up. This week, we have had horrendous on this panel and, you know, have come to the fore are quite tragic stories about exclusion. And I guess what I would call like the hidden crisis of spiritual abuse. I know that there was a lot said um, and addressed in the council about, you know, the harm um, and tragedy of, of the isolation that's, you know, come from, you know, the, the systematic um, clerical abuse, child sexual abuse that's happened. Was the spiritual abuse that kind of everyday abuse of people in parishes from women, LGBTIQ folk and other people who feel marginalised addressed? I 
can't speak for every group, but for the group that I was in uh, and the public sessions that I attended, the plenary sessions, yes, it was certainly. Um, uh, many, of the pub, many of the interventions um, in one way or another came to the point that you're, you're making, Tracy. I think, um, I think there was, a, and much of the whole, much of the Thursday, in fact, uh, was also devoted to that, that question. Um, my view was that it was a shame that more of the uh, interventions weren't live streamed. I think they could have come up with a, with a way in, in which the privacy of some people and some topics might have been protected. You could have had another 45 or 50 minutes each day where you would have had a connection with, with that wider Catholic community. And I think one of the costs of um, erring on the side of um, the bubble rather than the links to the community uh, was that many of these stories and, and, and the attention which um, members of the plenary council were giving to these questions perhaps is not immediately obvious to the wider Catholic community, not yet anyway. Yeah, I, th I think that's really important what you're saying there. You know, thanks for that. And thanks for all your insights tonight, Geraldine, Paul and John. I'm just going to pass back to Genevieve. Um, it's been great being with you all this week. Thanks so much, Tracy. And look, thank you to everyone who's contacted us to say how much you've enjoyed our week-long plenary tracker, the ideas, the conversations, some really revelatory moments along the way as we've tried to make sense of this enormously significant Australian Catholic Church gathering. I do note the involvement of so many people from the Australasian Catholic Coalition for Church Reform and Concerned Catholics, Canberra Goulburn. It uh, does cross my mind from time to time as a local that there's almost a cabal of Canberra Catholics, a bunch <laughs> of thinkers and doers and activists and advocates. And it's been such a privilege to be engaged in these really rich discussions. John Warhurst, over to you to wrap this up. Thanks very much, Genevieve. There are lots of thank yous I do want to give. Uh, of course, there were three and a half thousand registrations for this uh, program, and I want to thank all those people for being part of our community. I want to thank Concerned Catholics, Canberra Goulburn, the whole team who've stayed the course for five years. I want to uh, particularly thank the National Coalition, um, Australian Catholic Coalition for Church Reform and Garrett Publishing, without whom this would not have been possible. Without mentioning names, I want to particularly thank the whole project team behind the scenes, the producers, the moderators, the technical support, uh, the 22 guests who've appeared over, over eight days, a pretty remarkable uh, achievement, representing the diversity of the church in Australia. And all of this has been brought together, uh, well, by a number of people, but two amazing people in, in particular. Uh, the first, and, and my thanks to them, are, are unbounded uh, they are absolutely amazing. The first is our executive producer, Judith Tockley, who has brought this whole caravan together over, over eight days. Uh, thank you, Judy, from the bottom of my heart. And also our presenter extraordinaire, our host, who's carried off this week uh, marvellously. So many people have got back to us, Genevieve, to say what a remarkable job you've done. And once again, from the bottom of my heart, we're so indebted to you and uh, something I've always wanted to do, and that is to say, back to you, Genevieve. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good, very good, John, after a long history of you and me chatting over the years. Look, just finally, my thanks to everyone who's been watching every night, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you, such a sign of optimism and communal belief in the future of the Australian church as we move forwards. The plenary resumes next July for its second assembly, and we will be back to keep track of those critical developments. Thank you all and good night.